Hello, everybody. Steve Shank and Steve Spencer, the two Steves in the house today from Paraquad here in St. Louis. We are going to be talking about people with disabilities and the workplace. Stick around. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to Simple Biz 360 podcast. Happy Veterans Day. We're actually taping on Veterans Day. Uh, you're seeing it a little bit later, but we want to thank everybody who's uh, served in our military branches and for all the sacrifices you and your families have made. So thank you so much. And such a pleasure to have Steve Shank and Steve Spencer in. So there are two Steve's, so we're just going to call them Steve Shank and Steve Spencer. So uh, Steve, just uh, if you could let us know a little bit about yourself, if you will, that'd be great. Sure. So I was, uh, you know, I'm from St. Louis. Um, I actually have a uh, paralegal degree, but decided I wasn't going to really enjoy working for lawyers, I don't think. Um, and so I didn't really know exactly what I was going to do, um, you know, after college. But uh, I ended up finding this, uh, this ad in the paper about a job at a place called Paraquad that said we encourage people with disabilities to apply. And how often do you ever see that? Yeah. You don't. You don't. Um, awesome. And so that's kind of how I got into working for Paraquad, just this ad. And uh, my dad, several years before, had cut out an article about Max Starkloff and said, hey, I know that place here. Like, he gave me this article. I read it and said, okay, I'll give it a shot. Let's wow. go check it out. So, um, and so I have, um, I have muscular dystrophy. And so not really until about 2003 did, uh, did I have to start using a wheelchair because okay. it's kind of progressive where you know, slowly over time, you might lose sure. a little more, a little more strength. So, um, yeah, yeah. Even though you know it affected some of the things I could physically do um, up until that time, um, it really wasn't until um, about 2003 that I had to use a wheelchair full time. And you know, Paraquad, great place to be if you're going to be yeah. dealing with that kind of issues. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, how long have you been employed by Paraquad now? I uh, I started working at Paraquad in 1997. Oh wow. Awesome. Long time. Wow, that's awesome. So 24 years, huh? yeah, 24th year, yeah. that's great. I loved it so much. That's why I'm still there. Excellent. <laughs> well, Steve Spencer, how about you? How did you, uh, you know, do a little bit about yourself, if you could, maybe? Well, uh, technically my title is an employment specialist, but that, that title has many, many hats to it. Uh, I originally went to school to become a ASL sign language interpreter, okay. and... <clears throat> Uh, I had this teacher that would start off a multitude of anecdotes with, well, back when I started at Paraquad, back when I started at Paraquad. So that kind of ingrained in my head, like, I have a lot of respect for this guy. If he started his career at Paraquad, yeah. that's where I want to be. And uh, graduated from college, got my uh, interpreting certification, and then I, I kind of started thinking about it. I was like, you know, I have two friends that identify as part of the deaf community in uh, to paraphrase a saying we often use at Paraquad, if you know one deaf person, you only know one deaf person. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't identify a whole culture by one experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so when a friend of mine told me they were, that the employment specialist position had opened at Paraquad, I thought, this is going to be a great way yeah. for me to get to know the culture a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, so I applied for it, applied for it again, and then I got hired, and uh, I, I've been loving it ever since. That's awesome. uh, it, it's just been educational, fulfilling, uh, and most of all, we're out there doing good yeah. work for people. Well, a a amen to that. And uh, yeah, no, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for, for giving us that overview of yourselves. And uh, how, how many years you've been working there now? It'll be nine years in March. Okay, so nine years in March. Um, you know, I, I have to admit, you know, getting ready for this show and getting to absorb everything, I really didn't know a lot of distinguishing things about people with disabilities. You know, you had heard the ADA, American Disability Act, and that passed, and we were just talking 1991, I guess. But, you know, you heard the terms, and you you know, you ran into some people in your in your day-to-day -day walk of life, but you never really started to, to put yourself in the shoes of somebody that's, you know, got a disability and understanding some of the things and nuances about life. So what we're going to talk about today is a, is a, is really two gentlemen who are part of a company in St. Louis here that's, that's created this uh, wonderful atmosphere of assistance for uh, people with disabilities and, and, you know, the job place market and just understanding 
things more. So we're real excited to have uh, have him on here. I actually uh, uh, go to a uh, Bible study with Steve Shank on Friday mornings, um, yeah. and so that's how I got to meet Steve and then uh, interviewed uh, um, Steve Spencer when we got ready for the show. And and, and just the first thing I'm going to have to say is the enthusiasm <laughs> pouring out of you guys in our initial discussion on a Zoom call, I just said, you know, this is going to be good because th- these guys have a lot to say and, you know, just very interesting, you know, background. So, so S- Steve Shanky, let us know a little bit about yourself. Um, l- let us know a little bit more. Like, when did you discover that you had, um, you know, y- y- that you had been um, diagnosed with this? How old were you? How fast did it progress? What, how was, you know, sure. what, what was going on in your head and your life with this? Sure, sure. Well, you know, when, when, I, when I was 10 years old uh, is when I was officially um, diagnosed. Um, although I'm from St. Louis, uh, my dad worked for Monsanto. And for about five years, from probably about preschool age to about fourth grade, uh, we actually lived in a small town in Idaho called Soda Springs. Wow. Um, and then we eventually moved back to St. Louis uh, when he got a different promotion. Uh, so, but, uh, there was a, uh, a family doctor in Pocatello, um, that had worked in a clinic with kids with muscular dystrophy. And when I was very younger, he noticed how I would get up from the floor where I kind of had to use my hands to push up and stand up. He noticed right away and, and I kind of gave him a clue. Hmm. Um, so then we went to the, you know, the hospital with a muscular dystrophy clinic in, uh, Utah in Salt Lake city. And then that's when they kind of figured it out. So at first they thought I had probably the most severe kind, which is uh, Duchenne, um, where it basically creates, makes your body not be able to create any dystrophin at all, which is what your muscles need to you know, grow um, or regenerate and, you know, for building strength, things like that. Um, but it turned out that wasn't correct. Um, and it was more, they're not really sure exactly what kind I have still, they just know it's muscular dystrophy, and uh, but it basically, you know, is half is, you know, has an impact on 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 mine. That's about half what Duchenne has. Okay. Um, sort of, uh, you know, they for the longest time they thought it was what's called Becker, which is kind of a lesser version. Okay. Um, so essentially, you know, when I was a kid, I could walk and run around and do do things mostly like other kids. Um, some things like riding a bike, I was never quite able to, to quite do that. Um, and then, of course, when I got a little older, like, you know, middle school, whatnot, um, you know, that's when you could really notice the difference. Like, hey, I can't, I can't do like some of these sports things the way other people yeah. do. Um, and then, of course, when, uh, when I got to high school, that was probably the hardest part because I was really struggling with acceptance and not yeah. wanting to be that yeah. disabled person who kind of walked a little funny and right. you know just I, I spent a lot of time kind of hiding from it like yeah. having a disability was a bad thing and I didn't want anyone to know about it um, which probably was a was a bit of a mistake um, you know because I think some people maybe I got picked on a little bit here and there but I think some people probably would have been different if I was just open and said hey this is what's going on yeah um, so yeah, that was, that was very much a struggle and definitely after high school, the struggle got worse and, um, I really kind of started blaming God and looking for, you know, I was really angry about a lot of stuff and I was kind of looking for like somebody to blame almost. Um, and so, yeah, I struggled quite a lot with, with blame and yeah. blaming God and just being mad at, mad at all kinds yeah. of stuff and just not being able to accept um, wow. So, so, so by the time you got in a wheelchair, I had to go in a wheelchair. What, what age are you at at that point? So I would have been probably, I believe 23, okay. 24. Um, and I could still bear a little bit of weight, but it was getting, yeah. it was getting so that, uh, I couldn't get up from a desk myself anymore. I couldn't, yeah. if I fell down, I couldn't get up without help. And, you know, it just, it got to the point where it makes sense to yeah. do this. And, and honestly, it was a huge relief. It like um, made a lot of life less of a struggle because it didn't take so much energy. I didn't have to worry about yeah, sure. falling down on an icy sidewalk. Yeah. And, um, so, so actually the wheelchair definitely um, was a form of empowerment. Now, I still hadn't 
dealt with accepting it, even though even though I worked at this place, Paraquad, you know, which I started in '97, um, you know, I still hadn't really accepted being a disabled person myself. Yeah. Um, even though I was all all on board with for other people, and yeah. and honestly, just like you, I didn't really know anything about the ADA. I didn't know about the civil rights right. movement to get disability rights. Right. Um, I didn't really hardly know anybody yeah. with disabilities. So um, talk about being in the right place for dealing with, you know, a progressive disability. Um, you know, it was like, yeah. you know, God put me in the right place for sure. Yeah. Well, I know. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I know re- we really appreciate that. And I'm going to s- switch over to <laughs> Steve Spencer. So I, I, I'm assuming you, you don't, you aren't a, categorized as a person with disability and, and if I'm correct what got you involved in Paraguay how did you become an ally there uh, well like I said I uh, originally went to school to become an interpreter and uh, when I got on board with Paraguay I had actually uh, worked for a few other agencies in different positions before that because you know you got to build your yeah. career and everything and uh, by the time I got to Paraquad, I had a, a really a much much more improved awareness of uh, not just uh, the segment of deaf culture, but uh, disability culture as a whole. And I was learning a lot more about autism, uh, uh, cognitive disabilities, physical disabilities, visual disabilities, and. You know, you mentioned the enthusiasm that we're bringing yes. to the table here. I got caught up in that wave, you know, uh, yeah. working with Steve, uh, my my other coworkers and everything. You know, you walk into Paraquat and you see people that believe in what yeah. they're doing. Yeah. And I had caught wind of that. I wanted to work for Paraquat and it just grew and grew and still grows every day that I'm there. Uh being an ally, I would say, is primarily about listening. Okay. You know, um, I don't know everything about disabilities. Yeah. I I think the greatest thing I know is that I I always have room to learn yeah. more. So, so, so you you had, I mean, is it fair to say you had a calling or a passion as a young man, as a teenager, as a young adult to do <laughs> to work with uh, to help people with disabilities or not? Uh, it, there was a running joke when I I, I was in, in my childhood. Uh, my family would often laugh because my, my catchphrase was, what do I do now? What do I do now? What do I do now? I had a grandfather that suffered se- seizures that I was very, very close with. And uh, he received a uh, brain injury in a car accident when I was, oh, I was probably not even one years old. Mm. Uh, so if... Everybody had to go to the store or whatever, and he stayed home with me, and he had a seizure. You know, I would just try to rack my brain. What do I do? What do I do? And these seizures were common enough that, you know, they weren't thinking they were endangering me or anything by leaving me with him. Uh, But it'd just collapse and then come to a second and be like, oh, I fell. Uh, But he'd wake up because I'd come up with all these weird solutions of, you know, like, I'd put Lincoln logs in his pocket so he could <laughs> lever himself up and things of that nature. Uh, uh, so I, I think there was an aspect of yeah. me that was always kind of yeah. geared toward yeah. it. Yeah. Interesting. Well, and I, you know, modern medicine and things, you know, when you think of it, and thanks for sharing that, you know, I was as a young guy at uh, six years old. I live in uh, Wheeling, West Virginia. So I was right outside of University of Pittsburgh. And the University of Pittsburgh is a big experimental um, institution. They do a lot of groundwork there for things to come. And they hadn't, tubes in the ears hadn't been uh, medically approved yet. So I was part of the test group. And oh. I want to say it was 65 or 66, but I was going deaf as a five year old. They diagnosed me. I was maybe 25 or 35% in one ear and about 45% in the other. Literally, where my parents could be in the front of our Vista Cruiser, our Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser, talking about me, and I, wouldn't, I couldn't hear it. Oh, wow. So they did. They tried putting the tubes in my ears back then, and they did it, and it certainly worked. And I had to swim with lamb. You know, my my only uncomfortableness with it is swimming with lamb's wool for the next fifteen years. You know, I just couldn't let any water in there, and it's still kind of tender to this day in certain situations like that. But you know, my my hearing became crystal clear almost. You know, and I, where I could, I mean, I've. I don't even have much deterioration now at age 63. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and I kind of just, um, oh, well, matter, matter medicine and boom, there you're on your way. But when I 
when I watched the Max Starkloff, um, um, Max and the Magic Pill, and you know, kind of flooded me with some thoughts that, wow, I really hadn't realized how fortunate I was because I I could have very well, I, though they diagnosed me with getting going deaf, mm -hmm. you know, if it wasn't taken care of. So, you know, but but it just kind of brings you back to, wow, um, I'm taking this for granted and I shouldn't. So we're, we're gonna. Um, we're going to park on that. I'm just going to let you guys know. So uh, one of the pieces of this Paraquad puzzle and the, 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 the founding of it is a gentleman, St. Louis-born gentleman named Max Starkloff. And Steve Shank said, and Steve Spencer, you know, you said you got to watch Max and the Magic Pill. And actually, I found it is 1995 it was done. And it's, uh, so if you go on YouTube, Max and the Magic Pill, we'll actually put it up. If you go into the show notes on our YouTube channel, on this show when it's eventually put out in your episode 111 uh, we will have a link to the Max Starkloff video so anybody if they're on our show listening to hey then we have to go search for it but if you just if you just type in Max and the Magic Pill yeah. phenomenal mm -hmm. for me not knowing anything about it preparing for the show I really just uh, was touched I was amazed I was dumbfounded that I didn't I I'd, I'd been in the dark to a lot of this, you know, and not really understood it fully in the capacity that I think any American or any, you know, human should. So, so really, really cool thing. And, and the thing about it, folks, and, you know, I, I want you guys to touch on your version of this a little bit, is I watched the show, I understood what it was saying, I caught all the, the stuff, and then talking to you, Steve Shank, you said, you know, it was the civil rights movement for... Uh, people with disabilities and and folks it, it I mean it it, it absolutely 100 percent on the money there because you watch this uh, special and you really start to soak it in and get a feeling for it you realize this was Washington DC this was ground level grassroots efforts thousands and thousands of people with disabilities flooding the capital barking fighting nudging prodding pulling poking whatever they could to get the government to listen to this and start focusing on you know the the disabilities um community which is huge right yeah i mm -hmm. mean uh, correct me if i'm wrong am i are we talking like uh 20 million or are we talking 80 million what are we talking pretty much i mean it's big yeah yeah, it's 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 a big big number. It really There's, is. Yeah, <laughs> numbers aren't my yeah. my game, so I don't know the exact of but, it. But but I mean, just things we take for granted. You know, the retail stores. We you know, and I used to mm -hmm. make retail I mean, a product for retail stores, and they used to always say, "Oh, you know, that fixture you're bringing in is that ADA compliant." And you know, you never think of this, but this mm -hmm. ADA compliance, you had to have a wheelchair, have the ability to move around that fixture, so that that person with the disability is an inconvenience if they happen to be in a wheelchair. But the disabilities go, you know, way, way further. So, yeah. you know, um, tell me, I mean, Steve Spencer, let's start with you. Tell me, you know, the Max Starcloth story, the Max and the Magic Pill. I mean, you now live it. You're seeing it. You knew the man. You worked for the man. Or, I was not fortunate oh, enough to. Didn't? Steve did, though. Steve did. did. Oh, you yeah. did. Yeah. Well, did. so let's use your perspective and then go to Steve Shank. But what, sure. I mean, okay. tell us what you feel about, you know, Max Starcloth, this, this, documentary the the civil rights movement the whole ball wax okay well uh you know you, you can't really think about paraquad without thinking about max uh and paraquad's uh technically tech uh celebrating our second 50th anniversary this year because of the covid pandemic uh but max founded this uh it, i guess the the story really starts with a car accident in 1959 yeah. He had a car accident. Uh, he was in his 20s. And if you think about, you know, when you're in your 20s, you've got dreams, you've got aspirations, you, you've got plans, mm -hmm. you know, you've got things thought out. And uh, because of that car accident, he ended up uh, institutionalized in a uh, nursing facility. And just sitting in, in there day in, day out, watching TV, your plans are just poof gone yeah. so uh he decided that wasn't the the last chapter of his story yeah. he was going to do something different and he uh just 
I think I believe it started right there from his room at the nursing facility. Yeah, started Paraquad with the idea of independent living. Yeah, right. Uh, the philosophy being, you know, we are more than just something you can put in a shoebox and yeah. file us away. We can go out and do things. We can hold jobs, get married, yeah. and have a life. And he did all of those things. Yeah. Uh, he founded uh, Paraquad. He and his wife uh, founded the Starkloff Institute. Yeah. And we, we talk yeah. to them fairly often as well. It's you know? great. Yeah, so yeah. he, yeah. he uh, also got involved with the cultural movement of it uh, with Justin Dart, Judy Human, all those yeah. folks. Yeah. Uh, to formulate an institution of Paraquad that really there wasn't anything like it yeah. in the Midwest at the time. There were a couple of places. Out, uh, I want to say Justin Dart had two facilities out in California. Yeah, like Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so this coming to the Midwest was just revolutionary. Yeah. Uh, there's a department for everything at Paraquad, uh, whether you're looking for an ASL interpreter, assistive technology, uh, there's a state of the art accommodative gym on our campus. You know, he made sure that Paraquad was designed to service all branches of life. Yeah. And it, it's just an honor to be yeah. a part of it. Is, yeah. Uh, yeah, Steve Shank. Oh, thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, I mean, what. Uh Tell us a little bit about, you know, what you think about Max. You work with the man. Yeah. You know what his yeah. vision was. and Yeah. So, like, when I, when I first interviewed at Paraquad, um, I was interviewing for a job to do, like, administrative assistant work for uh, – uh, they had a grant that was looking to reach people in North County specifically with disabilities. Um, and just, like, when I got interviewed, you know, the, the lady, uh, Michelle, who I worked for, um, it was, yeah, it was almost like a small family kind of thing, mm -hmm. like where, you know, you got to meet Max and his wife, Colleen, and they were in kind of on the whole thing. And we were, you know, Paraquad then was maybe 20, 25 people, much smaller place than we are nowadays. Um, so, and, you know, the significance of, of all that didn't necessarily hit me till you know, till after, you know, maybe a couple of years after Max Max had passed away, um, you know, I really, the more I look back and I'm like, wow, I got to work with, with Max Starkloff and, yeah. you know, and, you know, I'm still, you know, uh, friends with Colleen Starkloff and, you know, she's, anytime I see her, she gives me a hug and, you know, she was just fantastic to work with. Um, now, you know, I never worked directly under Max, but uh, for a while after, uh, for a while, I worked on a uh, accessible housing information clearinghouse uh, with Colleen, uh, which was great. And uh, and then uh, after that, I spent a lot of time doing uh, information referrals, kind of the biggest thing I done I did there, where people would call and ask things like, where do I find an accessible apartment? Or do you have a program to help me find a job? And all those kind of things. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, uh, so was he was he as dynamic in person as he comes across on that um, on the documentary? I mean, is he? Yeah, yeah, pretty yeah, much. You yeah. know, yeah, I never really thought of it as oh, there's this guy with a significant disability. It was just yeah, right. Max Starkloff and yeah. like somebody was you know passionate about the organization and um, you know I didn't really yeah. didn't really see him as like that extraordinarily different from anybody else. Um, which is, you know, which is good because I would say most folks with disabilities, you don't, you don't want to necessarily be, you don't want to be pitied and you certainly don't want to be, well, you're, you're so fantastic just because you decided to have a life like everybody else, right. you know? Now there was, and thank you for that. It was Max, um, did Max work with the, um, civil rights movement directly with Justin Dart and Judy and oh, people yeah. like that. He was involved in oh, those. Yeah. Okay. He was very okay. much involved. That's why I, I figured that I, I didn't exactly glean that, but I want to read you a couple quotes folks. And thanks for sharing, um, from Max. And, and again, gosh, you got to watch this. It's just, it's really a great, great hour long program. But, uh, you know, Max said that people with disabilities do not want to be objects of charity. And another quote right. I pulled from that was the real problem is not the disability. 
It's the limiting attitudes about the disability. And actually, Max said he included himself yeah. in the, that thought process. And when you think about that, let me read that again. The real problem is not the disability. It is the limiting attitudes about the disability. So from inside your you know, human makeup, I mean, it's, it's once, you, once you determine that, that I'm not going to be strictured to this limit, that uh, there is a limit list to, you know, I can go out and do what I want. And on the other end, what impressed me about that and listening to it, I thought, wait a minute, we're kind of guilty of this on the, on the other side of the fence, not understanding, you know, we're, a lot of us are putting limits on people with disabilities when we shouldn't look at them as having limits. That, that's up to them and, you know, whether they are limitless or limit, you know, or they have infinite, you know, limits that they can achieve. So I thought it was just really a mindset that he was explaining, and that's really what it was. It was a mindset that he had he had conquered inside those four walls of I think I believe he was in that um, nursing facility for about six or seven years. He mentioned I think it yeah. was, mm -hmm. but there was an influential person, somebody in there that really helped to to enlighten him and lead him along, and then Colleen. Uh, was in the therapeutic channels uh, where Max later on got uh, his therapy from, and Colleen was one of his nurses or th therapists, and yeah, they end up getting married, having three kids, and yeah, and and this comes out in the in the documentary as well, and it's just uh, extremely uh, interesting. But uh, but w w where we're going to lean into here is that, and I think the really the reason I read that last quote twice and the focused on it is because that's where I feel like the the embryo of Paraquad, the impetus of Paraquad, starts to grow outward into any kind of community because there are other Paraquad type organizations across the country, mm -hmm. but it's really the the embryonic you know center of okay um, companies, <laughs> companies. You need to understand the same things we understand about ourselves. You need to understand about us the way we understand about ourselves. You know that we can be effective employees and great employees. Mm -hmm. And, and that's where we're going to hone in on, because if you're listening to this and you could be in Sweden, which we have a listening audience, it could be in, um, it could be in California, it could be in St. Louis. There are organizations like this that, that um, you know, are proponents of independent living, but more or less, you know, more so proponents of, um, you know, finding, finding comfortable workplaces for people to fit into and, and getting companies to understand that. And, um, so, you know, I shouldn't say more importantly, but as importantly. So, um, Max also commented in the TV special that, and I'm just going to apologize, but I'm going to read this cause I don't want to mess it up, but that he, as he grew older, he became frustrated as he watched his friends' lives develop. And you know, that, that this, that this full-time care center, um, he just realized that that's where he wanted to, you know, he wanted to branch out and independent living became a focal point for him. Mm -hmm. So right. Steve Spencer, a little bit about that. How does his shape? You know, how did that shaping in his mind of independent living, um, how does that carry out today in, in Paraquad and what you do and what Steve Shank does with the organization? Yeah. Well, at the time that philosophy was formulated, uh, it was commonplace for if you had a severe disability, you were just institutionalized. Yeah. And the independent philosophy says nuts to that. We, we can go out, we can live lives. And if you think about the things that you do day to day, the, the hobbies you have, the work you do, put yourself in the mindset of how would I do this if perhaps I didn't have the same quality of vision or maybe I didn't move as quickly. Would you still be able to do your job? Probably. There'd just be minor changes mm -hmm. that needed to happen. And uh, uh, one of the things Max found, found, and it's mentioned in the documentary, that there, there was a lot of uh, lobbyists and everything that were pursuing the institutionalization method uh, because there was so much money behind it. Mm -hmm. But it actually cost taxpayers less to just support the independent living philosophy. So it was good for everyone. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, but, you know, accommodations don't necessarily mean, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. It, 
it can be something very, very simple. You know, give you a quick example. I had a gentleman that got hired to sanitize the handles of the shopping carts at the grocery store. The gentleman did utilize a wheelchair, but uh, he had to hold the jug with the sanitizer, the spray wand, and uh, be able to push his wheels. Okay, accommodation. What do we do about that? I ended up just going into our warehouse. I found one of those uh, baskets that carry oxygen tanks. Mm -hmm. We were able to rig that to his chair. Boom, put the uh, bottle in there and holds a spray wand. Wheels, sprays, wheels. Didn't cost the employer a dime. Yeah. And yeah. he's a great employee. Just somebody thinking through it a little bit. Just put yeah. a little thought in there. You can mm. get around it. And that's what the people with disability community does. They think of new ways. Right. Absolutely. It, it spawns innovation. Yeah. Thank yes. you very much. Yeah. Steve, yeah, does. yeah. Steve, any, any, you want to add to that at all or anything? Uh... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, basically it's kind of like, um, uh, sometimes you hear people say things that don't make a lot of sense, like, uh, what's it like to be wheelchair bound? Well, you're not bound to a wheelchair. It's not, <laughs> it's a, it's a tool for independence. You know, you can't walk. Well, you still got to be able to get around. So you use a wheelchair instead. So yeah, like innovation. Absolutely. I, I'm coming up with all kinds of different ways to do something like the way the strength of my arms is affected. You know, I can't lift my arms above my head. So Sometimes I can't do certain things, but if I prop my elbow up on the table or the counter, I can support my arm that way. You know, just yeah, coming up yeah. with different ways to be able to do things based on what you can physically do or not do, and you know, um, yeah, that you just you become. How am I going to be innovative? What can I do? Like, how can I modify where I live? Where can I? You know, what can? There's just so many different things you can do you just figure out tools and ways to do it and uh you know and yeah i do have to get help sometimes from people but um it's really more of of like you know with my wife and i it's more like a partnership like i can do certain things and she can do certain things and we both do things together to you know function well, i'll do everything i can for myself she might help me with some things i'll help her with other things and you know, it's just about learning to function sort of like as a team with people. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. Where it's not about, well, I just, I'm in need of something. I need you to give it to me because, you know, you feel like, well, it's the right thing to do to help. But it's more like, you know, what can we do together to, you know, you know, to, to support each other? Yeah. Perfect example is in the documentary, Colleen and Max struggle with a way to, you know, how does a, a small frame woman or, a, you know, a, a woman with, you know, she's obviously got a 200 some pound man. She's got to try to get out of bed and yeah. get going. How does she do it? So they figured out a way sure. and, you know, how to move him and how to leverage him. And she showed the plane examples, you know, putting him in the plane seat, how she did it. And, you know, they, they figured out and kind of engineered a way to, to do things, if you will, and which is uh, which I yeah. just thought was remarkable. So I, I definitely want to get into the company side of it. Thank you for sharing that, Steve. I want to get into the company side of it, but I think there's a couple misnomers, and I know we didn't we kind of glazed over this in, in, in our preliminary discussions, but I really feel like there's, uh, you know, in society there's a, a, a couple misunderstandings about you know, first of all, terminology, well, let's, let's get to that second. But first, the first thing is, who is a person with disabilities? Mm -hmm. I mean, so, you know, you touched on one before, somebody that, that has a hearing you know, deficiency of some sort, right? I mean, they're a person with disabilities, um, you know, muscular dystrophy. But, but give us an idea of what the range is. There's a lot more that we're not thinking about. Sure, sure. And there's, I mean, there's tons and tons of disabilities that are hidden or not necessarily noticeable. Um, you know, like before I used a wheelchair, if I was just sitting at a desk, you'd never know. If you didn't see me try to struggle to get up or whatever, you would you'd have no idea, right? Um, and especially things like, um, well, like mental health disabilities, right. you're not necessarily going to know that, that someone has a chemical imbalance that, you know, causes uh, depression or other different things. And you know, some of those, it, again, though, it's always about how do you accommodate around certain things. Like um, I've always described it, well, okay, like if you have to use 
some medication to manage, you know, a chemical imbalance. Um, it's kind of the same thing as using a wheelchair if you can't walk. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, it's not about, sometimes people think, well, only somebody who gets disability benefits must be, um, you know, must be, must be a disabled person or right. a person with a disability. Like we always say, you, you, you want to put the person first when you talk mm -hmm. about yeah. it. It's a person with a disability, not the disabled person. Right, um, right, right. Absolutely. So... Uh, yeah. Biggest, biggest phraseology change I learned looking at the website and everything, which, uh, yeah, so, I mean, there's just so many things, and, and you're right, the mental, the mental health aspect of people with disabilities is there. Now, does PTSD and things like that, is that also enveloped into, yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, not all, all disabilities are visible right. matters. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned PTSD. You can't just identify right. somebody having right. PTSD by looking at them. Uh, the mental components and everything. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily uh, consider myself a person with a disability, but I do have a sleep disorder. Without treatment, it affects my memory. Uh, but, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, it's easily right. treated, so right. I don't right. even uh, really acknowledge it that much. Right. Uh, and I think that there's also, especially with the uh, mental disabilities, uh, there's a self-stigmatizing out there that so many yeah. people wouldn't even acknowledge their own disability yeah. out of shame. Right. Yeah. And that that is something that, that I, I really hope we can address as a culture in the future too. Bingo. And you hit a nail on the head there. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. that's um, just something kind of radical for me that I encountered at Paraquad was like the idea of taking pride in it. Like that is just part of my identity. I'm like... Mm -hmm. Why would you want that for your identity? But yeah. yeah, it's just like, like, it's okay. Yeah, you know, it's part of who you are. The same as what color your eyes are, yeah. or how tall you are. You know, yeah. it's just part of uh, part of one of the aspects that makes you unique. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it, yeah, I mean, that's a great way to look at it. Um, so, uh, thank you for that, gentlemen. So, uh, going back to uh, episode one ten, this is episode one eleven. Episode one ten, we did. Um, a, a short show called Words Matter. Mm -hmm. So when we talked and had our preliminary discussion, uh, it, that came up. Not our, that show, but that words matter to the people with disabilities. And for instance, you know, mm -hmm. I, I changed, you know, I read that. I'm like, oh, okay, it's people with disabilities. I see what I'm doing, you know, wrong here in my own mind, putting certain words first. But that's really what, what the way you were supposed to, you know, the way that people with disabilities want to be referred to Mm -hmm. And so here's here's a whole section on the website at Paraquad about words. Can can you just shed some light on that and point people to it on the website? Yeah, yeah. We're talking about the uh, what we would call words with dignity. Yeah, um, and also just kind of like some social things where people you know aren't sure. Um, and you know it, it's really about just uh, being kind of considerate, putting the person first. Um, yeah, yeah, and things, just things like, um, uh, let me see if I can give you an example. Like, if you were at a party and you're talking to, standing next to somebody with, who uses a wheelchair and you're putting your hand on their wheelchair, it's the same thing as if you're putting your hand on their shoulder. And, mm -hmm. of course, it would be funny then if they rolled away and you fell down. It would be your own fault. <laughs> but just, just you, you guys do laugh at that, right? Sometimes, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah oh, yeah. 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 But I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, just certain yeah. Um, you know, things like that. But right. then again, like sometimes like in, in a store, maybe a little kid might be looking at me or whatever. And sometimes the parents are like, you know, like think that that's wrong. And I'm like, hey, no, it's OK. You know, I'm like, I love it when kids want to ask about why to use a wheelchair and things like that. Um, so I think also it's it's okay to ask someone um, about something if you're you're curious. Um, and I would say like every time you see someone, you don't want to run up and right. be like, "Oh, you're a disabled person." Oh, and right. Right. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but I think also like it, it's fine. Like uh, say um, someone asks, "Can I open the door for you?" That's fine. Um, sometimes I need help. Sometimes I'll even ask somebody. Uh, but it's also don't necessarily assume, well, so-and-so can't do something. I better run up and open the door for them or whatnot. It's, you know, like 
if you see someone and you think maybe they need some help or you can just ask, you know, just ask. Don't just assume somebody can't do something. So in line with that, perfect Perfect scenario, and thanks for letting us know that. And um, where can they find this on, uh, before I get to my question, where do they find this on the website? Well, if you just go to the Paraquad website, um, you should be able to just search or okay. find Words with Dignity on Paraquad.com, is it? It's paraquad.org. Dot org, okay. Paraquad.org. Yeah. So I'm in a parking, so, you know, you're in a parking lot, you're with your wife, you get out of a car, we're walking into a grocery store, and we, we pass the um, we pass the handicapped parking spot, and there's yeah. a single person in a Chrysler van with the machine going up, you know, and he, the, the person's getting ready to get, you know, in a wheelchair to go in the store. Now, yeah. wife says, why don't you go help that person? What, 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 you know, how does society, what do you do? Do you, do you go up and say, would you, would you like some help or is that not I would appropriate? Say, I would say for something like that, uh, probably not. Okay, right. You know, but but I'm just asking because it's something that comes up. I mean, right. you know, you're with people and they say, "Hey, why don't you go help that?" Well, I don't know if that's gonna yeah, strip depends. that person of their dignity. Yeah, it depends what's going on. Like, if just like, well, think of it the same way as like, if somebody is walking out of the grocery store and their bag broken, they drop groceries on the floor. You might go try to help that person no matter what. Think of it kind of the same okay. way. Okay. Um, you know, think of it as like, well, if it's something that would be going on with somebody else, and I would, would I do the same thing? Um, yeah, but you know, don't just assume because you see someone, you know, with a disability that they're right away going to need help or something. You know, most of the time they'll ask, or it'll be the same kind of scenario you might run into for someone without a disability where you might help them with something. Okay. So, so we just, um, thanks for shedding light on that. Now we just had an interview before you came in, uh, with a gentleman who has prostate cancer and, mm -hmm. uh, he stage four and he considered it a gift and Max Starcloth in his documentary, um, considered it a blessing that he had, uh, gone, got in that car accident and then he ended up where he was because he was able, and I, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm, I'm trying to recall, but he was, he was able to see life in a different way that, that made him realize he was not, not normal. He was unique. If, right. I'm, if I'm using the right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you, you know, anybody, a person with disabilities, they want to be perceived as normal as possible and just as, yeah. you yeah. know, we're, we're just going about life like you are. We just happen right. to be a little different, a little unique, a little presented with some circumstances you, you know, you haven't presented with, but you don't, right. you know, you're not looking for special treatment like Max says, you know, no. he's looking for society to recognize. Right, right. And so the, the words with words with dignity, it's called, I mean, great. I pulled it, I printed it at house. I, I meant to bring it today and I forgot, but yeah, um, yeah but it was, you know, and again, I, we, our last episode was just on word selection, word reduction, and, you know, picking the right words to be as powerful as possible. And here we're using, in many cases as a society, antiquated, undesirable terminology yeah. to yeah. describe, you, you know, a person with disabilities. Yeah. And don't be shocked, but, uh, Handicap, you probably don't want to use that word. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, but it's handicap parking. That's what it says. That's what they call it. Yeah, yeah. And the that, sign, right? But some, some places, um, I think, have actually changed even the the language to change it to accessible parking, or uh, just like terms like mental retardation used to be yeah. used, and um, lots of advocates and people came together and said, we don't like the word retarded or retardation. Let's get rid of it. Right. Um, which has happened, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, which is great. But see, there's a beautiful case. And made my point. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, because I'm so used to, you know, I see it still. Mm -hmm. I do yeah. see, what was the other term you mentioned? I, I start with an A, accessible. Park. Accessible, yeah. I do see that once in a while, but I still see handicap. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's out there, but th there's a perfect example of, you know, changing that word for another description because that's, you're not handicapped capped in your mind yeah. you're you know so yeah because the word i mean the word came from the idea of a person with a hat bagging you know and the cap yeah yeah oh is that where it came from yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh i didn't know that yeah it's the idea of like oh you know the disabled person has a cap in their hand because they need they're begging for money Get out. that's where that yeah. came from uh-huh mm -hmm. 
Oh, well, no one. That's got to be scrapped from every dang sign. <laughs> That's horrible. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that because you just hear, hear it and you see it on the signs yeah, and you don't think anything of it. Yeah. You think, oh, well. I never even looked into I never even thought of yeah. looking into the origin and, of it. And most of the time, I just consider it as like, well, you know, you might not never, uh, you might not have ever heard about that. So I'm not going to get mad at someone yeah. for using the term. Right. Occasionally, right. I might say, hey, some yeah. people might not really like that. Um, but I think a lot of times it's not intentional trying to offend someone. It's just if no one's ever told you, how would you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yo, well, thank you for shedding light on that. I, I'm, I'm so glad I, I learned something here and I learned a couple of things. So, uh, so let's uh, zone in on the workplace because that's really where you guys' heart is. I mean, yeah. you know, we all want to, you know, work. What does it do to us? I mean, it pays the bills, yes, but. You know, it also brings us self-worth and mm -hmm. dignity. And what do we what do we do as young men? We grow up wanting to be something. We want to be providers. We want to, you know, and now it's, you know, with the, with the birth yeah. of so many women in the marketplace, we're all kind of trained to be providers and, and you know, bring the money home and have aspirations for career development. And, yeah. and, and you know, people with disabilities are no different. Right. Right. And, sure. and to be put in an institution and to be stripped of those opportunities is, is now obviously and thankfully being eradicated right and left and things are opening up. But there's still some stigmatisms that are out there. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you even look at it in what, with, and I'll, you know, I can think of two outside the perimeter type of situations, but, but somewhat still the same flavor. For instance, um, I'm, a, I'm a recovering alcoholic, so 33 years. Right. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. And I had a guy um, had a guy building a deck for us once and he said, oh, yeah, I hire all uh, I hire all alcoholics that are recovering to build a deck. But we're going to build a super deck. And he did. He built a phenomenal deck. But I said, wait a minute, you hire all your every one of my employees. Why do you do that? Because they're the absolute best workers. And he said, you can find the best out of those people. They want to, you know, they're on a recovery. They've got this, um, they've got this addictive personality. If you get them to really like their work and be good at their craft, he said, they'll be on time. They work a full day. Unbelievable. And it was really astonishing to see the same thing. You run into some employers that say, give me an ex-military person any day. Yeah. And you find other employees that go, mm, I don't know about that, you know. But, you know, they don't want the alcoholic, recovering alcoholic. They might not want the military person, whereas other companies see it as a, as a great silver lining. Yeah. There's silver linings to hiring people with disabilities in many cases. But the, but the thing that we want to try to get across, and I'm, I got a passion for making sure I steer the, 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 the interview right, is I want future employers listening to this, watching this, whether it's in 2021 or it's in 2028, I want them to come away going, you know what? We have, we have kind of a screwed up mentality inside our company about that. We should go to Paraquad. We should, uh, you know, Definitely. we should talk to them about because we, yeah, I mean, they, I didn't realize these are, there are good workers over there. Let's, what mm -hmm. are we, what were we thinking? You know? So, so let's dive into that. Um, so what, what kind of people do you guys represent? Do you, do you represent the whole gamut of? Oh yeah. Okay. So and even people with PTSD can come to you? And, and oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, there, there's various different titles of programs okay. within my department that different people might qualify for and might not but overall you know okay you come to us you you got you you right. got you've got a pool you know. of people yeah. um and so uh if you could kind of walk us through steve shank if you could kind of walk us through um what what is a what does a process look like let's take the Let's take the um, person with the disability side. What does that person listening to this show yeah. inside their house have to do within the next, you know, couple of days to get the ball rolling with you guys? What, what? Right. Like if they, they want to find out about programs or yeah. services and what to do. Well, probably the, the best place to, uh, to start is to call our information uh, referral department. And uh, people can just call the main Paraquat number, 314 uh, 289 4200. Okay. Um, and, uh, they can, uh, just ask the receptionist for someone in the information referral department. Um, and then, uh, specifically like if a person's interested in things related to, uh, to employment, um, they can get some information from the information referral department. Um, they could, uh, you know, people, um, interested in employment could also call and, uh, 
talk to me uh, or talk to Steve. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, and there's okay. it, we have different ways of serving people, um, and depending on uh, if you qualify for disability benefits or not, different things. There's different routes and ways that we can work with people um, and, and get services funded. Uh, but some of the some of the like the core things that that any place like because see Paraquad has there's centers like Paraquad that are all called centers for independent living. Every state has a whole network of them, um, and each center has a group of counties they serve, and they're going to do things like information referral for helping people find resources. They're gonna do things like uh, some general independent living kind of skills, training, or you might almost call it like life coaching. Okay. Um, and then uh, there's a lot of things related to advocacy, um, mm -hmm. doing like a lot of public policy work. Okay. Um, and then one of the big important things is what you would call peer support, which means somebody with a disability being able to talk to someone else with a disability uh, because who's going to understand more than someone else with a similar disability? Um, and then, of course, you also have uh, what what would be called transition, and that could be things like um, helping someone figure out, if I want to go out in the community, figure out how to not live, say, like if you're someone living in a nursing home type setting, maybe a younger adult, never been able to live on their own, um, someone to kind of guide me through how can I make a plan to do this? How can I figure out how to get all my needs met and you know get out in the community? Mm -hmm. And um, you know I can think of people back in the years when I was doing information referral where somebody may have called us that was in a nursing home and two or three years later, you know, I talked to them again about something else and they were in an apartment on their own after working with us. Wow. So that, that was always, that, uh, that's gotta be, yeah, it's gotta charge you up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So basically, you know, anybody with a disability who wants to find out about resources yeah. and things in the community, there's going to be a center for independent living, no matter where you live in the U S that covers your County where you're going to find somebody you can talk to, um, about whatever it is you're looking okay. to do. So if someone's listening in Nevada or Iowa or, or mm -hmm. South Carolina, is there a, an organization usually in that state that, that um, collects all that countywide data or, yeah, or information? Yeah, usually, usually most states will have a statewide independent living council. Okay. Um, or if you just look up CIL or Center for Independent Living in the state of Nevada or okay. whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, so there, you, you should be able to find okay. things pretty easily by just by uh, just Googling that. But those or, would be your keywords, Center for yeah. Independent Living, yeah. CIL. Um, okay. There's also the National Council of Independent Living, NCIL, um, uh, dot org, I believe. They have, uh, you know, there's like a national directory on there with a map where you can click and okay. and find any, any of them. Um, and also, like, if someone's listening to this show and they're in another state and they can't figure out where do I go, um, if they call our information referral department, they'll be able to go in and kind of look and figure out, hey, in your Excellent. state, you can go here. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, great. And you guys service primarily the St. Louis kind of metro area on the Illinois side and then some Illinois too, well, is that right? Well, let, basically for some of the employment stuff, for okay. a niche of the employment stuff, we do some Illinois. Um, but the, and then the rest of the things we do are all mostly St. Louis city and county. Okay. Uh, some of the employment's going to touch on uh, Jefferson and some of St. Charles. Yeah, occasionally. And, okay. Yeah, and some of the programs are things that, um, like the uh, Health and Wellness Accessible Exercise Center, um, it doesn't necessarily matter where you live if you have a way to come to us. You know, you can participate in certain programs. Uh, certain things, depending on what it is and where you live, um, you know, you may have to go to a different center that works in whatever area you live in because they're going to know the local resources and everything around better than like I would. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. And, and what's your phone number again? Could you just shout it out again? For Paraquad, it's 314-289-4200. Okay. okay, great. And uh, yeah, so great. Well, appreciate you doing that. And um, the, uh, the networking, I mean, we hear so much about networking today. Yes. You know, LinkedIn, and I'm part of Christian Business Network, and we got all these different things. Um, you know, CBMC, where we go, Christian ben Business Men's uh, uh, Community, and, and things like that, so connectivity. So um, how does Paraquad network 
um, with prospective regional employers? I mean, what what proactive things are you doing to let people know about Paraguay? Anything I can. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I tackle it really any, any way I can. Okay. Uh, I'm a regular face at nearly all the job fairs, the big ones anyway. Okay. Uh, I, I keep in touch with the Missouri Job Center to see if there's any hiring events. I go, I meet the HR managers, the hiring managers, uh, try to network with them. So, you know, they, they start kind of thinking, I, I'm a little short staff. Maybe I should call Steve, see what he's got. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that does happen. God, I love it. Thank you, God, for that. Uh, and then sometimes it's just, Simple as cold call. I'll go into a restaurant, see a now hiring sign, and say, hey, can I talk to your manager? And then we'll have a little conversation and try and grow things from there. Uh, but it's always really important to me, uh, you know, not only that my the participants, the job seekers come to me see, thinking, okay, this is going to be unique, individualized service based yeah. on my needs. But the employer needs to realize that as well. You know, I'm not going to treat – a grocery store's hiring needs the same way as a uh, restaurant right. or a construction company. You know, I want to get to know that employer as much as they want to share with me, so that I can give them the best match for their needs. So, it is so, it a, is it a one on one relationship you're really building with that HR department? Ninety percent of the time, okay. yeah. Wow, yeah. yeah. Uh, we know each other by first names. Wow. Sometimes I'll walk into a job fair and somebody will be like. Oh, it's you again. It's like, yeah, it's me again. All right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's great. So what you're you really watch? out there on the front lines being an ambassador for this and trying to trying to build a network. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think I think it's worth mentioning the uh, the Nexus groups. Uh, mm -hmm. and the Nexus groups are made up of like agencies like Paraquad and any other type of uh, disability service agencies, um, like the state vocational rehab programs. Uh, mm -hmm. different people are part of these networking groups and we have one that covers like St. Louis, St. Charles and uh, one that's over in uh, a lot of the Illinois area but the idea is too like when we have meetings and talk about different jobs and different supports that are out mm -hmm. there and we also invite um, employers all the time to come and talk about positions they have open um, yeah. you know and, and talk to us about what their company has to offer uh, because then we you know, all the people that participate in it, whether it be Paraquad or some of the other great organizations out there, um, collaborative, you can say, hey, you know, we may have some clients that would be great for some of those yeah. positions. Um, sometimes we act as sort of like the, the intro, like we kind of introduce certain candidates and then it's kind of handed off from there. And um, so there's, yeah, there's, it's not, you know, the goal isn't just for like, well, we want everybody who needs help with a job or whatever to come to Paraquat only. You know, we, we want to have that collaboration between everybody sure. because it's not, sure. you know, it's not a competition between agencies. Right. It's more like let's mm -hmm. all work together yeah. to bottom line help folks with disabilities have more opportunities to do the things like everybody else wants to do. You know, have a job, yeah. earn money. Mm -hmm. Well, and isn't it isn't part of that mission kind of, hey, because this is the way I see it. Hey, if you're out there in employment land and you're employ you're an employer, yeah. we want to help you recognize things you're overlooking about our community. Right. Our community is very beneficial. Yeah. We have right, a lot to give and you're overlooking it or are you? So that right. bridges, you know, to, to this question. Do you guys have any type of aside from going to the, the career shows and things like that and markets and fairs, is there an educational process you offer to companies? Like do you ever I don't know, do you ever do anything online like a webinar or a zoom call where you where you invite prospective employers and you go through an hour seminar on yeah okay yeah uh yeah. The, again there's kind of a range to that yeah. too uh you know sometimes my employers will contact me and say things of the nature like okay i'm not really sure what to say yeah can i use this word can i use that word <laughs> and i want yeah. them to make I, I i make sure that they feel comfortable like hey all you got to do is ask. There's no question yeah. too small. You're not going to be looked yeah. at as stupid or offensive. This is a learning yeah. thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes they just want that casual conversation. But uh, for more intensive like, seminars like you're, you're talking about, it's uh, Access STL, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Access STL. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. that is a program we, we sponsor where we'll come out and you know give you the words with dignity sure. uh, mm -hmm. last year sure. and then a multitude of other things about accessibility for your yeah. business or yeah. your building's business. Right, yeah. if you want someone yeah. to kind of 
help you check out your business and see if there's ways you can improve the physical accessibility. Yeah. You know, they can do things like that. And yeah, you know, pretty much anybody who says, hey, we'd like to have someone just talk about uh, people with disabilities in general or, um, you know, educate our HR department more or just our company in general, you know, uh, all they got to do is call Paraquad and uh, um, they'd be able to talk to someone yeah. like in our, um, in our public relations department and we could arrange to have anybody come and talk about, yeah. you know, talk about whatever, yeah. whatever they're looking to do. Yeah. So, so if your company are, wants to yeah. dive in the deep end or just put your toe in the yeah. water, We've got options. Yeah, yeah. So you guys are really, you're flexible, you're hungry, you're innovative. <laughs> you, any way yeah. you want to, you know, do this, we're ready to do it, which That's I right. think is, uh, and you know, I mean, again, I don't, you know, just knowing you for what, a year now, right? Somewhere around there. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it wasn't sick. I, it was six months had gone by before I realized you were a person with disabilities. I never knew watching you on another zoom camera lens right i never knew anything i yeah. mean th then that's my my point is nor will customers of these employer potential employers nor will these employers you know it, it yeah. there's so many you know there's so many misconceptions we have been trained as a society to uh, to just swallow that are just you know goofy yeah. stupid unnecessary i mean i'm you know and i'm part of it i mean i'm thinking i forget what you call um the 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 part of a of a city um, sidewalk that goes to the street. What's the term for it? Like the curb cut. Yeah, curb oh, cut. Yeah. Yeah. So so curb cuts, right? I mean, uh -huh. how many dilapidated, crumbling, horrible looking curb cuts have I walked over, stepped over in my life? It's got to be in the thousands. Yeah. And never even thinking that that's really hard. For someone in a wheelchair why do yeah. we do that why isn't that why isn't that money appropriation coming to the city or coming from a grant or whatever going to that yeah. first right yeah and same thing it's more than that it's like a mom with a stroller uh, you know there's mm -hmm. there's a bunch yeah. of different reasons somebody with a cart full of boxes they're trying to deliver somewhere there's all kinds of reasons um yeah and one thing saying that one thing that interesting little tidbit uh you know, the buses, the pub, the public buses that have a lift or a ramp that folds out, you know, for someone in a wheelchair. When uh, when Paraquad was first around um, in St. Louis, one of the things they did is they helped do a lot of advocacy to get it so that buses would have a way someone in a wheelchair could actually get on that bus. Mm -hmm. And whereas they didn't before that. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, I mean right. before Paraquad got involved and was one of the big yeah. players in the advocacy that made that happen yeah. in St. Louis. I mean, I tell you, watching that, watching Max's, Max and the Magic Pill, I, you know, watching the um, civil rights movement of, you know, f advocating for ADA, I mean, you felt like you were in the 60s. I mean, you saw, you know, it was really yeah, energetic was really, watching it. Yeah. Like, But, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, I can't believe this is the 90s. You know, right. when Newt Gingrich was Speaker of the House and everything, and, or, you know, I mean, I just, I'm like, I can't believe it took that long, but it did. And, you know, it takes us, it takes us a while as a society to overcome some of these, you know, misconceptions. And, I mean, I, I just, I applaud you guys for what you're doing. And I, and I, you know, I really just, I'm awake now where I wasn't as awake, nearly as awake as of just even a couple weeks ago. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, um, it's just great. So, uh barriers to employment. So, I mean, l let's stop for a second and park on COVID. You know, the COVID, we were going to a, you know, remote workplace business model yeah. in a lot of places before COVID. Yeah. But now since COVID, we've, we've just accelerated. We're now, if we were in first gear, we're now in third gear towards this. Mm -hmm. And so many places are doing it. So, so many employers yeah. are proving, okay, they can, there can be productive employees at home. And this, is tailor made in a lot of cases for people with disabilities because it just it takes it out yeah, yeah it can be it takes yeah. out the travel and all this and that but um so what are some of the barriers to you know getting a match made with a company and a and a person that you represent at Paraquad what are some of those barriers you're still seeing uh well uh like I said 
the the silver lining of the pandemic has made remote work a yeah. lot yeah. more available and options before the pandemic yeah. when somebody would come to me and say well i'm looking for remote work i i would think okay well i got to share to them that that's going to be very difficult because mm-hmm. uh, the opportunities just weren't nearly as out there as they are now so yeah. that's a silver lining mm-hmm. there right uh barriers that i see to employment now uh mostly stigma uh yeah. and not not always stigma of oh well that person can't do what i need but also the stigma of as an employer, I'm afraid to ask. I'm afraid to yeah. have oh. that conversation. Wow. Uh, what if I say the wrong thing? What if I accidentally break a law or unintentionally wow. discriminate? And that that's another big part of what we do when we network with employers is say, hey, you know, that's part of the reason why we're here. You know, yes, I am working for the applicant to help them with their job search. I want to assist with that the best I can. But I'm also here to make sure that the employer feels comfortable learning. Like you said, two weeks ago, your mindset, Mm -hmm. very different than what it is now. Mm -hmm. Right. And here we are having a good time having a a talk. Yeah. That's available for potential employers too. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, And then uh, the... Another barrier would be the cost of accommodations. Right. Employers get very scared about that. But the fact of the matter is, usually an accommodation is something you got to take care of one time. Like the, yep. the analogy I told you yep. about earlier, that was a basket I had laying yep. around. Yep. Didn't cost a dime. Uh, accommodations that do cost money, statistics say, usually one time under $500 type accommodations. Yeah. And oftentimes there's so many resources out there that you can contact yeah. to get things like that covered and cost. Right. Yeah, it, it shouldn't be a worry at all. Yeah, and there's more things that get built into technology and things nowadays yeah. too, like being able to do speech speech to text. Um, there's a lot of uh, professionals that use uh, what's called dragon speaking yep. where you can control almost everything on your computer through your voice, but mm-hmm. it's not just a an accommodation thing someone that might not be able to type with their fingers well uh, would use. I mean, there's doctors yeah. and lawyers that use it. There's, yeah. you know, there's a lot of things just that... just on phones now. Yeah. yeah. Text. Yeah, there's yeah. just <laughs> lots of things that people yeah. can use. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah. So yeah. there's there's all, more and more tools that everybody uses that you might not even think about is, oh, that actually could be an accommodation or something someone uses too to, uh, you know, to adapt to a need. It's really, uh, yeah, really, when you bend your mind around it, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's not as constricting as you ever really, I mean, as you first imagined. I mean, you're like, hmm, yeah. gosh, we can, that can, yeah, that can be done, this can be yeah. done, this can be done. I mean, it yeah. really is. It's, a, it's a, yeah, it, that's interesting. Um, I, I sold, right out of college, I sold dictation equipment in, in, in New York City, and, and a lot of us are still, uh, we still um, connect with each other to this day, and it was a good group of uh, folks I worked with back in the mid-'80s. And what was just coming on the horizon was a guy named Kurzweiler, a German guy who he, did, he really was inventing the digital uh, nature of converting, um, you know, the, the spoken word into print, into text. And of course, Kurzweiler, and believe it or not, you know, the, any phone we use now has so much of Kurzweiler technology built into yeah, it. Yeah. But even back then, we were like, wow, wouldn't it be cool if there was a day where we could just, you know, use a Dragon app, you know, and speak into it and, you know, Dragon Speech and, and have our voice turn into text. And, you know, it, it's it's been here and we certainly have, you know, harnessed it, although you have to check the words sometimes, I found out. <laughs> Still, <laughs> yeah, no yeah, matter what you do. The hard way. But at um, um, any rate, uh, yo, so. Yeah, there you go. I mean, there's just so many things. Technology has advanced us, and and the and I would just think overall the openness, the the, the walls have kind of come down a little bit in companies about the you know apprehension to pursue mm-hmm. a remote worker because you know it's just it's. I mean, there's there's companies that are closing their their office buildings. Their, I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, in New York City, it is like a ghost town right now. I mean, the amount of people. That Chicago amount of people that haven't been back to their offices since COVID. I mean, yeah. you know, I know a guy I worked with in New York City. I mean, he he retired just a couple months ago, but he uh, since COVID hit March March thirteenth, he had been in his office in New York City twice in sixteen months. Twice. Necessity is the mother of invention. So I mean, it's uh, so we're seeing a lot of cool stuff. Um, so Steve Shank, uh, ticket to work. Yeah, WIPA um, and and your interaction with the Social Security Administration. Can sure, you just sure. kind of pour out about that? Yeah. So the particular program that um, that I 
basically manage or, or run. Uh, it's called Ticket to Work, and it's uh, it's funded by Social Security, um, and it's it's for people that are receiving disability benefits. So that would be SSI, Supplemental Security Income, and SSI is is something a person would qualify for if they have never worked enough to qualify for retirement. Um, and so Social Security Disability Income, or SSDI, is basically collecting benefits from your what you paid into the retirement system early because of your you know because you became disabled or have a disability. Um, so, so um, through those programs, uh, Social Security created the Ticket to Work program, and the whole idea is if um, if you get disability benefits and you feel like I want to try to work. I want to see how that goes, but I'm not not really sure how well I can do it or how it's going to go. Um, the idea is, well, they want to give you a shot to try it and see if see if um, see if it's something you can do. But for a lot of people, there's you know the the, the process to get to the disability benefits that they got approved for took a long time was hard to go through. And it's like, I don't want to do anything to mess that up hmm. because, you know, I need that. Or now I finally got, was able to get Medicare coverage or Medicaid coverage. Um, if I go to work, what if I lose that? Like, you know, I, I need that. Um, so the whole idea was, well, we want people to, to be able to try working but not give up their eligibility. Um, so, for example, like with uh, the Social Security Disability Income, they literally let you, from the time you start getting disability benefits, if, say, you start working, they'll give you uh, nine months called trial work periods where they'll let you have your check, your benefits won't be affected at all, and you can earn as much as you want while you're trying out how how's this working thing go. Um, and then, uh, you know, it goes farther than, okay, say you you get into a job and it's working well and you're, you know, you're making a decent amount of income, Um then they'll let you um, give you like 36 months where every time, every month where you earn more than a substantial amount, a substantial amount called a substantial gainful activity amount, uh, which is right now it's like 1310 gross. But basically every month for 36 months where you earn above that, you know, it's like pressing the pause button on your check. Okay. You're still considered eligible. Um, if like the next month or like your health declined or something happened the next month, you basically are, you know, contending your benefits again. It's kind of like being able to press the pause yeah, button, yeah. being able to press the pause button or, uh, for <clears throat> folks to get the supplemental security income SSI benefit, when you get earnings up to a certain level, um, they reduce, you know, SSI reduces your check based on how much you earn. Um, when you get to a certain level, it goes to zero, but you're still considered, eligible it's again like pressing the pause button if you're working earning at a certain level we'll keep it at that um and then there's there's things built in where you can still keep your medicare eligibility because there's a lot of folks that you know are on on the program that that i do um uh, and our, the program i do is designated an employment network so paraquad's one of what's called an employment network would take it to work um and then we also work with a lot of vocational rehab clients and other things uh but, yeah, but there's a lot of folks that, hey, I might be able to get a job that's going to pay me enough to replace my disability benefits. Um, but I still need to make sure I have access to certain yeah. things like Medicare or I can get a job but it doesn't have the best health plan that covers all my needs. Or you know, there's some people that uh, might rely on a program called Consumer Directed Service where Medicaid helps pay for uh, like a, a, an assistant um, like an attendant who might help them get up and get ready for work in the morning and get dressed. Um, so there's there's programs um, where uh, people can uh, keep their Medicaid eligibility um, up to a certain amount of earnings because you know it's realized that well you need that's part of the tool that lets you be able to work. Um, and even like if the state has to spend money through Medicaid, you know to help you with the, that certain eligibility or services. Um, Overall, you know, the money you're you're generating in taxes and stuff by working is is mm -hmm. is greater than anything being spent. So, you know, certainly uh, spending a little bit to get all that return, you know, is, yeah. is worth it. Um, 
So uh, the whole idea is kind of like being able to have um, a safe way to try out working. Yeah. And uh, one of the cool things is like when people sign up for the Ticket to Work program, um, the whole idea behind it is we want to support someone who wants to try getting to working at a, at a more full-time level or you know having more of their generating their own financial uh, independent yeah or I'm uh, not you know generating enough money to not need the disability the benefits yeah. Yeah. and being able to work um, and the, and the cool thing is like they consider that um, just because you go try and work one of the things they do when you sign up and use the tick to work program is they say okay you know when you get disability benefits if you're not working or anything um, every couple of years they want to review a person medically uh, to see if they have you know if they may have a condition that could change or make it so that they're not really you know in the disability yeah. category anymore but one of the cool things they do is they say okay just because you try working we're not going to assume that means well you must not be disabled anymore or have disabilities anymore um, but what we want to do is we we won't come in and review you medically um, and assume just because you try working that well you must not have any need for yeah. disability benefits because um, that's that's a worry that people have oh, you know yeah. people hear rumors on the street and different things like oh if you work they're going to take away your yeah, eligibility yeah, yeah. if yeah. you work they're going to do this you know we we kind of help people you know, find out what the real truth is uh, and yeah. and make it so that hey you know what it's it's built in where they want, you know, Social Security wants people to be able to try working. Um, and, you know, maybe not maybe not everybody will ultimately accomplish that goal, and that's okay. Um, you know, um, and at least my program specifically, we're, we're more targeting folks that are definitely of the mindset, I want to work as much as I can. Okay. Um, now, you know, some folks might want to work just a little bit to make a little extra money because, you know, that's either what they want to do or the level they really can do. Um, but there's there's lots of ways Paraquad can work with people. So no matter what the person's employment goal is, um, there's going to be some way we can try to work with them yeah. uh, to help them, you know, be able to get, be able to work. Wait, wait, who, do you spend more of your time with the actual person with disabilities on the education and guidance process than you do the companies? I mean, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. For, for me... Um, as a ticket to work specialist, yeah, that's the primary thing I'm doing. Yeah. Um, a lot of times I, well, I'm going to coordinate, like Steve and I will work together if we have someone that comes to us that either doesn't have a job yet or maybe say like has a job that's not ideal or they lose that job. You know, we're, we're kind of a team effort. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be focused more on what is this ticket to work? How does it work? You know, how does it work with my disability benefits if I try working? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what's going to happen, like, say, if I get this job and 10 months later, yeah. are they going to just take away all my benefits? Or, you know, guiding people on, here's all the work incentives yeah. and things built into the system. Um, and then Steve would come in and be, like, helping with, uh, let's look over your resume. Let's talk about what kind of jobs you want to yeah. do. Um, here's some, some jobs that are out there right now I can think of that you might be interested yeah. in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do I talk about a disability accommodation if I need it? Um, he's he's going to do a lot of that and then the networking with the companies and such. Um, and I'm going to be doing sort of more of the support of this is how everything works. This is how yeah. you know, disability is going to be looked at. And then uh, at Paraquad, there's also um, another program that's separate from my program that's also funded by Social Security where all they do is focus on what happens if I get disability benefits and I want to go to work. Like what are all the different incentives and tools and options that, that – uh, you know, the, yeah. the Social Security has and the state of Missouri might have through Medicaid and other things. Um, and so so that's called WIPA, Work Incentive Planning Assistance. Um, and so that's a free service Paraquad offers. And for that one, we actually are funded to cover about half the state of Missouri because um, we have <coughs> different folks they contract with to do these benefit counseling sessions. Um, and again, for that, um, people can uh, just call the uh, the Ticket to Work helpline or they can just call Paraquad. Yeah. Um, and if we're not the right place for their area, we'll help them find where to go. That I mean, great segment. Thank you so much for outlining that. I mean, if you're out there and you're a person with disabilities and, you know, you've had questions, you don't 
you don't know how to navigate because there's a lot of complexities in in what you're talking about. There's a lot of yarns just going in and out. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. you know, what do you have to know about and what do you not have to be apprehensive about? Right. What, what You know, you're kind of like this data bank of, of let me, you know, cross the T's and dot the I's for you so you know what yeah. to expect, which, yeah. I, I you know, never really realized how important that is because you don't want to, you know, obviously just, and that's the fear I bet out there is they don't want to disqualify themselves for one thing if they enter into another. Right. Mm-hmm. And there's this overlap period that, that grace period. So no, uh, phenomenal. So again, guys, you know, chomp on that and, you know, make use of that. You know, Steve Shank and your title over there would be, uh, I'm called ticket to work specialist. Okay. And, yes. and Steve Spencer, what's your, what's your title? Employment specialist. Okay. So, right. so you guys kind of work, you know, there's a little bit of overlap from your side to, to work with him, but you're, mm-hmm. you know, obviously w- what you mentioned before, more on the employment side too. So can, is there anything you want to elaborate on, on your function that could tie into what Steve said for any listener out there, company or, you know, person with disabilities? Uh, yeah, for uh, those with disabilities that are curious about work, uh, but you do feel scared of, you know, having your health care cut, cut or your uh financial livelihood affected ne- negatively don't don't worry about it give right. us a call we can help you straighten it out those WIPA counselors are a godsend I ask them questions all the time I've been doing this nine years I still get confused yeah. so yeah and wow. they never yeah. make me feel bad for asking a yeah. question right. Right. so uh it, it's a it's amazing a very amount of information yeah 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 it's a yeah. very comfortable way to access a huge amount of information yeah. sure um uh, and for the uh, business partners that we have hiring from us, you know, we'd love to have you join us. Yeah, you know, well, I mean, reach yeah. out, and we'd be happy to talk about what we can do Man. to assist you with your staffing needs. Guys, I'm telling you, I am smelling Paraquad podcast like big, <laughs> big time. I'm telling you, I mean, what, I mean, because there's just, you know, there's so much and there's, and I can, you know, I can put myself in the, in the, in the seat thinking through some of the apprehension levels, thinking about some of the, I imagine there's constantly changing governmental guidelines and stipulations and striations of this, that, or the other. I mean, I don't know, like anything else, there seems to be just an ever changing nature about all that stuff. And, you know, as this, as you know life meanders along you kind of help that person understand you know where where is the meandering taking place where are we going and sure how can you do it and 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 from everything i'm hearing from you guys it's and how do we take the fear out of it for you how do we straighten it out for you how do we yeah. make it understandable for mm-hmm. you sure you know which i think is uh, is great um uh, and again, I'm, I'm reading sober some of this stuff because I don't want to miss anything because I want some of this to really be uh, used. But um, f- touch on some of the success stories. Do you have any success stories of companies that have hired Paraquad um, represented um, people? And, and have you know, what are some of those success stories you can talk about? Oh, yeah, gosh. Uh, that, that's part of the joy of what I do is it, it's successful. Uh, I don't want to name any company's sure, name sure. specifically, but uh, shoot, just two weeks ago, uh, there was a local company that had hired a gentleman from me. And I, I had just fo- made a quick phone call to follow up and make sure that he was doing sure, okay and transitioning sure. into it. And they said, oh, my God. You work with him? Oh, yeah, he's he's fantastic. We love him. I want to meet with you. Let's have lunch. And we, we sat down over lunch and had a big conversation about what we can do to bring more of my candidates into his staff. Um, probably going to be following up with another meeting next week on that. Um, there's another employer. Let's go back to the beginning of my career with Paraquad. Uh, they uh, do staffing for maintenance services in uh in federal buildings and they hired somebody from me and now sent they've they've hired, actually hired several people from me but whenever she calls me she says either get me a cloning machine or <laughs> get me another guy yeah, like yeah. john yeah. doe because yeah. i want like five more john yeah, does yeah, yeah so yeah those that engage with us you know i'm not going to say every single situation yeah. works out perfectly because Otherwise, it wouldn't be a job. I have to fix things sometimes. Sure. Uh, But, yeah, Yeah. everybody we work with seems to really enjoy what we're doing as a service. Uh, I 
can't think of a single business partner that's Good. ever gone completely Good. south. So Good. Well, and, you know, and you're right. You're so right. You know, people with disabilities are a microcosm of society. We have, you know, we hire poorly right. sometimes, and there are people that are, end up being employees that really don't toe the line, and I imagine that, you know, it comes with yeah, any, yeah. you know. Sure. And, and the thing, a thing I, I do want to add to the, the note of this is, sure, hiring from the general population, you can find great candidates that, that way as well. Uh, but one aspect I think that is unique from the candidates that Paraquad Employment Services has access to is that these are folks that know, oftentimes know that you are doing something different. You are thinking outside of the box hiring them. They hmm. want to impress you so that you see that they're, the population they're representing isn't to be dismissed. Right. So... Right. You're gonna get somebody. That, is there that's that loyal. brotherhood like that in? I I believe so. Yeah, I see. Wow. I see it a lot. Yeah. And uh, people want to persevere. They want to be successful. Um, I'm gonna throw another quick anecdote uh, at you real quick about a participant. We'll just call him John Doe. Uh, so when I met John, he had about three phrases he would say. You'd ask him a question. He'd say, "I think so." No, and hi, how are you? I think that, that, that was about it. So gentleman didn't even really have confidence in himself enough to say yes as one of his phrases. It was like, I think so. Three years later, following up with him, this guy goes to work half an hour early every day so we can go in the building, go around to everybody and say, good morning, how you doing? He's a social butterfly now. He's taking a ton of pride in his work. His employers mm. absolutely adore him. Mm. He gets the job done great. So uh, that's a mm. win-win right there. Yeah. The employer's super happy. He's boosting morale in the workplace. And yeah. it's an evolution for yeah. him. Yeah. Uh, the work has paid yeah. off so much intrinsically to him that he's growing as a person. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, he's his self-worth, his... his uh, you know, a world's opened up to this young man too. Yeah. That you know, my gosh, this is so fun. Look what I can do. Look at you know, again right. going back to Max. That you know, there's there's not that that mindset that's confining. It's you know, this the yeah. world's open up to this young yeah. man. Yeah, and what we have we have people uh, with a varied range of abilities. You mm -hmm. know, I have sure I have people coming in saying mm -hmm. I need a job as a dishwasher, but I've also assisted people with finding work as yeah. software developers. Yeah, right, exactly. So, oh, I bet. Well, yeah, yeah. spectrum. Yeah. Wow. You know, I so one of our friends, um, her son um, had Down syndrome, mm -hmm. and he worked in one of the grocery stores as a bagger. And mm -hmm. I mean, and now he ended up uh, moving into an apartment with someone else years later. So he was, you know, um, I mean, he was just, you know, a, gr a great young man who who adopted that independent living. But for him to to listen to him tell you about his day's work i mean you could tell the joy mm -hmm. he got yeah from doing that job you know you you couldn't interview 99 other people and find joy coming from them about their job like you could him so there's you know there's this uh yeah. um it, there's this so I, again i appreciate you saying that guys if you're listening out there and you're an employer i mean it sounds like there's a go the extra mile component um mm -hmm. to Definitely. some of these um folks too oh, that wow. just say you know we want to prove that not only did you make a good hire, you made a great hire. Yeah. You know, I mean, right? I like the way you put that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, just, you, yeah. can, you can use it, by the way. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, spread some encouragement to anyone out there who, what would you say to someone who's chin, I call them chin rubbers, they're sitting home, go, oh, man, I've never called Paraquad before. So, so from a, from a person with a disabilities point of view, what kind of encouragement can you give them? And what kind of encouragement could you give to a future employer? So I'm going to ask you first, what could you, uh, let's see if I, if I was talking to a person with a disability, um, you know, first of all, I would say that, you know, we're all about when we say independent living philosophy, that means personal choice and direction. Mm -hmm. So it's not, why don't you come to us and we'll tell you what you need to do. It's more like, why don't you come and say, I'd like to be able to do this, or I've always wanted to try this, or what about this? What kind of things can you give to help empower me to do that? Um, and a lot of times I would say, like with what I do, 
um, a lot of folks that, that come to me might, uh, might already be in the place where they're ready to get a job where they feel like, you know, you know, I, I've had a lot of professional experience in my life and then, you know, whatever happened in the last three years, you know, haven't been able to work. Um, but I think I'm ready, to, you know, I'm, I'm in a place where things are getting better. Um, and I think I'm ready to do this. A lot of times I've found like once we get to have some conversations about this is how the benefit system works and you can try out working. And if it doesn't work out, you're not going to suddenly have the rug pulled out from under you and be stuck with, well, what am I going to do until I can get benefits started again? You know, it, sometimes it's, it's like we give you some, some tools and a lot of times that tool might just be the right information and knowledge and be able to help someone understand something more than anybody else. Sure. Like I've had lots of times over the years where um, one of the most gratifying things that I heard was, wow, you explain that better than anyone else ever has. I actually understand now. You made it clear mm -hmm. to me. And so sometimes all you need is the right information and that proves to be the empowerment. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the people then that are doing really well, you know, there isn't actually a whole, whole lot that I've had to do like with them together. You know, it's more like, it's, it's kind of like in the background, you know, information, you know, helping with some tools to give you, you're not worrying about what's going to happen with my benefits and other things and I can just go for it. Um, and a lot of times then people, yeah. you know, they're not worrying about those barriers and those different things. And, you know, I have some clients where you know, I might help them with, um, you know, we need to report what you're earning to Social Security and these are the things you do. And I can help with some of that background stuff so they can just focus on working and, and seeing yeah, how well yeah. this is going to work. And, um, you know, so that's the most gratifying thing is, you know, not being able to go, oh, well, I helped someone do this. It's more like, I helped maybe with some of the information and tools they needed, but they're the ones who went out and did it. Yeah. Awesome. Very a great answer. Thank you so much, Steve Spencer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what, what encouragement could you give to companies that are chin rubbing out there just saying, I don't know about this, you know? <laughs> yeah. You well, know. uh, you know, if, if you're on the fence out there, uh, I hope you've noticed that we're really enthusiastic about what we do. We yeah. love working for Paraquad in, the results, the success that comes with it, it it's a regular thing. Mm -hmm. So if you're scared, you're nervous, put that aside because I'm excited about what I do and I'm going to be just as excited when you pick, when you make that phone call and I pick up the phone and hear you on the other end. Yeah. I can't wait to speak with you. So yeah, give no. me a call. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and what's your number, by the way? I don't know if you want to give it out, but um, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know if you're welcome to, but yeah, you know, we'll, I can. yeah go ahead. I, I, I'm, the main line, of course, 314-289-4200. Uh, but if you want to call my direct extension, it's 314-289-4263. Okay. So Steve Spencer, Steve Shank, well, um, this has been enlightening. And honestly, you know, you, I, I just listened to you two gentlemen. You know, you, you know, we... we we all, well, not all of us, but so many of us want to, you know, contribute to society and, and feel like we're making a difference and helping. Yes. And, you know, I start this podcast in my own little way. You know, I'm trying to pay back just little business tips that I've learned over the years. But it, it pales in comparison to, you know, what what is pouring out of you guys. And, you know, not only do you get to live, um, you know, out your mission in the workplace, but you know, you, there's a genuineness, you know, that coming from you guys that you really want to make a difference in somebody's lives. And, and, um, you know, that there's not every job has that baked into the <laughs> oh, essence yeah. of We're the job. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, it really, you know, your, your work, you know, a lot of us work just to, to bring a paycheck home and to be right. able to help somebody break a barrier and come out of their shell and and realize that they can enjoy life in a magnitude and a capacity that they've never thought before, whether it's on a, the receiving side or on the giving side to somebody, you know. And uh, and then again, on our side, I, th I just think we need to continue to pound. You know, what's evident to me being a, a newcomer to this information is, you know, um, I'm really, I'm kind of a knucklehead for not understanding it better until I'm 63 years old, you know, I'm, I'm like, oh, really to take, you know, but now uh, all you got to do is watch the, the, the max and the magic pill. And trust me, 
I think anyone watching that would come away with, hmm, okay, mm-hmm. I, 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 I have to think of this differently. In 1995, I mean, nothing's, nothing's changed under the sun in terms of what Max says in that documentary yeah. or what it covers. It really, uh, really is interesting. So before we get into a cool, fun segment that you guys gobbled up, which I love, <laughs> um, what, uh, is there any question I forgot to ask you, Shank? Uh, wow. I think, uh, I think you've really kind of covered a lot of the stuff we really okay. wanted to hit on. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, my favorite color is blue. <laughs> that. All right. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, you, yeah. you, you did great. Uh, thank you for having okay. us. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, if you're hiring, is... let me know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate it. All right, guys. Yeah. So now we get into, uh, oh, I want to, before we forget, so the Paraquad website, just one more time, and then the social media, where can they get them, I assume, on the bottom of the website, is that correct? Or Yeah, or, yeah. like, um, it's, it's, you know, Paraquad, P-A-R-A-Q-U-A-D dot org okay. um, is the website, and the main, main line, again, is 314-289-4200. And are you guys on? Uh, are you guys on uh, LinkedIn and on Twitter and Instagram? Or do you guys have social media? We have a media? Facebook page and a YouTube channel as yes. well. Okay. So okay, you do. Uh, the YouTube channel ha- has some some uh, great testimonial stories and everything. Excellent on there too. Yeah. So. so great for employers to go t- visit. For sure. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. Okay. Okay, yeah. great. And then if you're out of state and you're not in this market, the Paraguay Services, again, just type in Google CIL or Centers for Independent Living right. and in your state, and that should open up a, a, you know, a host of different yeah, Google yeah. connections. Again, you, and, you can go to uh, NCIL or National Council for yeah. Independent Living, and there's a whole national directory that covers centers like Paraguay all over the country. Yeah. And, and guys, if you're out there and you're in, you know, North Carolina, you're in Florida, you're in New Hampshire or Michigan, and you're listening to this and you're going, yeah, you know what, what, what are these words with dignity? Yeah, just jump on their website, take a look sure. at some of this stuff and, you know, start to break down the barriers in your own mind, just in the confines of your right. own, you know, listening right. space. So, and, and you can definitely jump on the uh, Ticket to Work website if you yeah. just type in Social Security or Disability Ticket to Work program, you'll find the main website and this program exists all over the country too okay very yeah. cool so the next segment and we're going to close the show with this uh these two guys by the way are rock and rollers just <laughs> want to establish that right now some great stuff i was pumped um so at the end of every show you know we just kind of have some fun and and again i think it's i think it's emblematic of what i'm trying i was with a company as an executive vice president for three years or we could not have fun oh and it was terrible. And if you smiled or you held the contest and somebody won the contest and it's 545 and you know, everybody's clapping, you get called in the office and why is everybody clapping? You can't clap. You can never do this again. Nobody. And you had a smile on your face. Something was wrong because you were enjoying work. And I say, <laughs> I say, you know, out the window with that. And, and you guys, I, I think I'm, you know, I think we're sharing the same common ground here and that not only can you provide good workers? Not only can you help people realize what they, what potentials they have, but I mean, life's too short to not have fun Indeed. at work, right? I mean, you're, yeah. you're a happy, you smiley, fun guy. And you know, you're always very true. upbeat and, and you know what? Um, gosh, you know, let's have some fun. So we have some fun at the end of this, at the end of this segment and we dip into what we call lost in the shuffle. So we go back into rock and roll and songs that are important to each one of us. Um, we usually ask our guests to pick out something that maybe didn't, you know, make the top of the charts or, you know, number one or wasn't the first song on the album or whatever. And, you know, what's, but what's important to you? And so you guys picked out some pretty cool tunes and, uh, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna start with you, Steve Shank, and then we'll go to Steve Spencer because it's, uh, okay. it's Christmas is coming up. But so, what, what is your uh, what is your Lost in the Shuffle track pick? Uh, well, there's a U2 song from uh, the '80s called uh, "Bad," and it's from um, "Unforgettable Fire." And you know, I never really figured out why they called it that, but I liked I liked the lyrics and, and I liked the music. Um, and so, I, I mean, I recently found out actually from you that that song was actually written about, um, you know, someone or someone that was dealing with heroin addiction. Mm-hmm. And I, I, you know, once you told me why they called it, why, you know, that mm-hmm. that's why it was written. It's like, oh, OK, that's why they called it. I, I kind of get that. But it, it never I, you know, I never connected with it for that reason. I didn't really know what it was about. I just knew it was 
you know, it, it connected with me in a lot of different things, like uh, some of the lyrics on it about, you know, like finally being like wide awake, like yeah. getting it about whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, tremendous. We just did U2 a couple of months ago. We did uh, a song off of their Octung Baby album, which I always have said Great it's album, probably sure. one of the, yeah, I, I categorize it as one of the five best albums of all yeah. time because it, yeah. it turned a corner for U2. It had a musical difference in it that was distinguishable, more distinguishable yeah. than anything else, but bad. I decided to put up the, uh, looked at it last night, and I decided to, we're going to put up the uh, Live Aid version of this because it's a 14-minute yeah. version of Bad. Every, everybody out there is you too. If right. you don't know it by name, you'll recognize it by tune. But, you know, so interesting, um, never made the charts anywhere, but it's always a concert centerpiece. That the, the crowd loves it, and it is one of those rallying songs. And, yeah, it is about... Uh, one of their friends from Thin Lizzy um, had died from a heroin overdose and back then and in Dublin where U2's from. There was a lot of heroin usage back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. But in the 90s, he wrote about, you know, a lot of people they had known that had passed away from uh, heroin overdoses. And we're, you know, we're in the middle of an Oxycontin crazy mess, which yeah. isn't that, you know, which is worse in many cases. So mm -hmm. um, just a great song uh, by a great band, uh, one of the best bands ever, honestly, and a uh, great pick. So we, the Live Aid version, really cool, really a good uh, a good pick. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, and then you, oh man, and both you guys told me you love this genre, but you picked one uh, out of your favorite genre. You mentioned you mind if you oh sure share that. Uh, so I, I am a was a teenager in the '90s, and I love all the the grunge era stuff, mm -hmm. uh, particularly Chris Cornell of Soundgarden, Audio oh, yeah. Slave, Temple of the Dog. Yes. And um, kind of in theme with what we're talking about, you know, give somebody a chance. They yes. can do something different, yeah. uh, do something unexpected. And the fact that it's the holidays, uh, there's a uh, Ave Maria performance out there uh, by Chris Cornell. And when it came out, it was on one of those very special Christmas albums mm -hmm. with the Keith Aaron mm -hmm. artwork on the album cover. Yeah. And, you know, I just knew him as... This guy can wail. He oh. can scream. He's got that perfect rock voice. I didn't expect Ave Maria. Mm. Like it, it, it's beautiful in a way that brings tears to your uh, eyes. Yeah. Um, when you said it, and I read it on your email. I was like, Ave Maria. What? Well, you know, Cornell's got a, <laughs> you know, great voice, yeah. but but you know, but Soundgarden was one of the leaders of that that grunge movement. And yeah. you know, I immediately think of Black Hole Sun. I mm -hmm. think of, you know, Spoon Man is one of my favorites. Yes. I, mean, I just love Spoon one. Rusty Cage. But Spoon Man, I you know, when I heard that on the radio for the first time, and so you guys are teenagers. I'm a I'm a mid thirty year old guy. You know, can't wait <laughs> to get in my car in Newark, New Jersey, to drive home, coming you know, commuting to New York City, and you know, I would listen. I mean, this stuff was on. It was great. I mean, it was a great era coming from that neck of the woods. And Ave Maria, I mean, Chris Cornell, if you know his voice, unfortunately, uh, no longer with us. But um, yeah. mm -hmm. if you hear his voice, his, you know, it's just a special voice to begin with. Oh, and, yeah. and this version is very touching and uh, yeah. cool. So we're going to put it up. It's from 1995, I think, somewhere around Sounds there. Sounds about but, right. But so we're going to put that up. And... Uh, Wow, enjoy it. You're going to see the, um, you, we're going to put it up in the right hand corner of our visual experience on YouTube so you can see it up there. It's like a little card. You got to click on it because it comes in and disappears. But um, nonetheless, we'll put the link in also. If you go to YouTube and go in our show notes, usually your show notes is just what it has a little section. And you'll read a, a sentence about the show and it'll say show more and you hit that. It'll kind of blow up and you'll see all the links. And we'll have Paraquad up there, we'll have um, your picks. And, um, you know, certainly and we'll have the Max and the, and the Magic Pill up there, too. So, you know, viewers can just go right to our our YouTube channel and boom, hit those things. So, um, guys, it has been absolute pleasure. Thank you for t asking me about this because, you know, it's just a great I, I mean, once I got knee deep into it, I was like, wow, I'm really excited about this. And I am. I'm generally genuinely excited and I hope it can help. Guys, I hope out there it, it, this helps somebody because, yeah. you know, um, there's plenty of people to be helped in life. And, and uh, so this is great. So thank you very much for making the trip out. Appreciate it. And uh, guys, we are in the new frontier. It's experiential. It's atmospheric. And in the business world, uh, again, our mantra going forward is it's it's if you want to change the results of how your business is out there, we want to help you take a look at the how you do business because we're convinced it's it's not just this computer, but it's how you you sell this computer and you manage the relationships and you manage your customer relationships. It's the how that affects the results. 
So we're going to close with that. And we're going to say, guys, remember, do your own research. There's so much information out there that you can discover and find on your own. Do your own information. Be a truth teller. We talk about this all the time. We're so sick and tired of lies and hearing lies and figuring out what's truth and what's not. Be a truth teller. Become a truth ambassador at a young age. Be a truth teller. Turn TV cable news off. Please, it just turn on a podcast. Pretty soon, the Paraquad podcast, hopefully. Turn on a podcast. Get enlightened. Enjoy. But but turn off the TV cable news. It's nothing but just corruption in your of your mind. Um, seriously. And, and you know, guys, honestly, um, we just invite you to open up the Bible. It's full of great stories. There's so much adventure and history and knowledge in here. And pray. And more than anything, love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul. Merry Christmas as Christmas comes up. Merry Christmas to you guys. And uh, hey, we will see you in 168 hours. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>